recording. Hi, I'm Dr. Patrick Mahaney. I'm a veterinarian in Los Angeles and Chief Veterinary Officer of Pure Dog Food, soon to be Pure Cat Food as well. Um, welcome to PetCon 2020. We're doing some fireside chats this year. Unfortunately, we can't all be together. We're doing it virtually and we have a very special guest here today. Introduce yourselves and introduce yourself and tell us what you do. Hi there, my name is Jane Lynch. I am a pet owner, pet mama, and I'm also an actor and voice actor. <laughs> so many skills you have. I mean, I feel like I've seen it all over the years in terms of your, your TV work, your, um, your movie work, and also your, your singing. Your singing is really incredible. Right. Yeah, and I don't know if I can claim I'm a singer. I'm not, the, well, I'm fine. I'm a good singer. <laughs> but I sing with Kate Flannery, who's an excellent singer, and I uh, basically uh, sing harmony with her. Uh, with a, a group called uh, the Tony Guerrero Quintet. And we have a Christmas album that is a throwback, a um, little self-promotion here, Patrick, <laughs> uh, a, a throwback to the late 50s, early 60s called A Swingin' Little Christmas. And it, it sounds like those Christmas albums that you used to listen to back when you were a kid, if you were a kid in the 60s, uh, like I was. <laughs> we have many copies of them. We've given them away to friends and I love having it on. And just like, your live show is so much fun as well. I've seen that many times. And um, will, will there be a virtual live show this year? There won't be a virtual live show. It's just too hard to get that together um, and stay safe at the same time. So we've canceled the entire tour. As you know, we have a huge tour of the Swingin' Little Christmas tour that we do. We've been doing it for like the last six years. And we rescheduled it for 2021. And God willing and the crypt don't rise, we <laughs> will uh, be back on the road for next, uh, next Christmas. Great, I look forward to seeing it. And we'll put on the, the CD this year around Christmas time, just to kind of get ourselves in the mood. Good. Well, we're here today to talk about pets as this is pet con and you are a pet lover advocate, like all things pets. So I have some questions for you. I don't have them memorized, so I'm gonna to have to read them, but that's just how my brain works these days. That's all right. So tell us about the pets you currently have in your household. We currently have Bernice and she is a, a black Cocker Spaniel, American Cocker Spaniel. And we don't know how old she is. We adopt uh, older dogs from a purposeful rescue, which is Hillary Rosen's organization, where she finds these unicorns, as she calls them, and she plucks them out of shelters. And she's picked so many dogs for us. And, um, and seniors, we, we like to take care of them. We like a project. And we have a very good vet named Dr. Patrick. <laughs> so we're in, we're in good hands. Um, Bernice, we think she's about 13 or 14. She's She's basically blind now, Patrick. She's um, almost completely, you know that. You saw her just last week. She doesn't hear a damn thing. Um, and she's the sweetest little mouth breather you've ever met. So we've had Bernice probably about three years. And yeah, three years. And now we have Mildred. Mildred, we just acquired. We just adopted her from a Purposeful Rescue. She is a Malinois, which was just like Benjamin, if you follow us on um, Instagram, you know we had a Malinois named uh, Benjamin that we adored. A older guy, and he um, passed away about three years into a, into his um, uh, being with us. And so now we have uh, Mildred. She looks just like Ben. She's very timid, just like Ben was. And we think Mildred is about, what do you think? You haven't seen her yet. You haven't looked at her teeth yet, have you, Patrick? No, she's not. She's eight or nine. She's, she's, so she's not as old, which I kind of like, because I love her very much, and I'd like for her to be around. Yes. Just so, so I've, I've only met her twice when I've come to the house for Bernice. She is so sweet and pleasant. Even like um, you would expect me coming to the household. I'm not her usual person. I like I show up at the front door and she's looking through the glass and she's like, hey, come on in. The china's over there. <laughs> the silver's yeah, in this drawer. Exactly. She's so sweet. Tail wagon and, but she is very timid and she gets spooked. You know, I think yeah. uh, who knows what her story is, but um, uh, we, we love her so much. She's just such a sweetheart. Just from seeing her kind of walk around the, your house so far, she seems very healthy. Like her mobility is good. Yeah. Um, when we were at last at the house for Bernice, she sat down right next to me and kind of leaned into me and I had my hands on her and she seemed pretty comfortable. Yeah. Um, so hopefully she doesn't have like any significant health problems and you will have many, many years with her. I think that might be the case. Yes, let, let's hope that's the case. Mm -hmm. All right, so what are your memories of your first pet or pets? Oh, we had a dog named Peppy that there was a, uh, a newspaper in our small town, Dalton, on the south side of Chicago. Um, oh God, I forget what it was called, the Dalton something. But in the want ads, or it, there was a, you know, uh, does anybody want this little toy poodle that we have to give up? And so my mother drove out to another suburb and picked up this little dog. My dad is, is of Irish descent mm -hmm. and his, his mother 
and father both grew up on farms and dogs were not something you had in the house. They were dirty, filthy animals. <laughs> and uh, so my dad never wanted a dog. And we finally, uh, he allowed us to get this little dog named Peppy and she was a piece of work. He, he, he was a piece of work. Looked like a little girl though, you know, with the little Ted, you know, when you get him groomed and everything, right. toy poodle, about three pounds. And I remember if you open the door or close the door and a draft is created, the dog would just like shoot across the room, tiny, 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 and kind of a bastard, <laughs> kind of a mean tempered. And um, obviously had, you know, uh, snarled a lot and obviously had, had some kind of abuse, but uh, he loved my sister. And my dad, who couldn't help himself, ended up loving Peppy and writing songs for him and gave him nicknames, which is what I do now. I'm, I'm definitely a chip off the old block when it comes to my, my dad. I make up songs for the dogs and I give them, um, whatever I name them, it doesn't matter because they're gonna have 125 nicknames. <laughs> Well, we have commonality that we both grew up with childhood poodles that were little menaces. We had little rascal who oh, yeah. like, was the worst poodle ever. I swear he used to like hide under the bed and you try to pull him out and he'd bite you. He would sleep on the bed. And if you moved your feet, he would bite you. He was like <laughs> exactly what you shouldn't have. Or like my family was example of how to not train a dog well, but. Exactly, we, we were the same way. <laughs> now we know what to do. Yeah. Um, do you feel as though your relationship with pets that you had as a child influenced how you go about having the relationship you do with your pets today? Hmm. You know, it's funny when I think about the pets, uh, I loved them, but I didn't have the like the bonded, like, maybe unhealthy relationships that I have with my dogs now. Um, they're, I guess they're like children to me. Hmm. I um, My heart breaks for animals. I, I want them all to be taken care of and loved and be happy. and. You know, I can only take on a, a few at a time. Sometimes we've had up to four in our house and um, I uh, kind of over identify with them, but that just means I love them so much. And I don't remember having that kind of a bond with Peppy or our other dog, Misty, who I loved very much. But I mean, the love that, especially my first dog, Olivia, who was a, a Los Opso and I got her in the year 2000. And I just turned 40 and I don't know why I didn't get a dog before that, but I just fell in love with her so deeply. And uh, she passed in 2017 after a really good long life, as you know, Patrick. She, yes. Yeah, she just had a really well-loved long life. We were gonna be getting into Olivia a little more later in this conversation. Oh, she was such good a special question. dog. Yes, yeah, she was. Well, um, all your pets are special, of course. Is there one particular dog or cat, we have to give cats a chance here, that kind of sticks out in your mind as the exceptional dog over the years that you, that's kind of like your heart dog? Yeah, my heart dog is probably Benjamin. Benjamin Malinois that we had for three years. Uh, he was a, a, an ascendant being. He was a tra <laughs> he was a, a, an ascendant master. He was so deep and so loving and looking into his eyes was like looking into the universe. It was so wonderful. And he also worried, he, he worried about you. He would like to look at you and you know, you'd say, hey, I'm fine, Ben, everything's good. And then he'd be happy, but he, mm -hmm. he was really, he was a deep, deep dog. <laughs> and he had, I, I always refer to him in my medical records as Gentle Ben. Yes, Gentle Ben, yeah. <laughs> he came to us as uh, Benjamin. They, they named him at the, at the rescue. And, um, oh no, he came to us as Gentle Ben. And um, we have a dog in our life named Finn. And I thought Finn and Ben was too close. And also I wanted to give him my own you know, whatever. So I named him Benjamin and he was Benjamin. And even our cleaning lady called him Benjamin. <laughs> he was a very special dog. He was so like gentle natured, easy to be around. Yeah. Very, very sweet. Yeah. Good boy. Good, good boy. And really Mildred reminds me so much of him, not only just in how they look in terms of her temperament as well. I feel like, although I don't know her very well yet, she seems to me very approachable. Like she doesn't seem very fearful to me, but I'm not around for like whatever else, noises, um, boxes. It's noises and stuff like that. And also she, if given the opportunity, she will take off and she oh. has, more. she will, I mean, here in Montecito, she's happy, she's rolling on the grass mm -hmm. and we open up the gate to get a, a, a you know, the mail and she took off. Wow. So she, she will take off, she gets spooked. Okay. Um, and I think she feels really at home with us. We've had her for a month or so and she's so happy, but that instinct to take off is very strong. Sure, yeah, that's kind of scary when you're just kind of, if you're walking her like downtown Montecito or something like that and something yeah. spooks her, you don't want to be dragged across the street. <laughs> right, and she's strong. She's really strong. But she's, she's a, yeah, she is. She's very sweet and she's very deep, you know, like, well, like Benjamin was. I look forward to seeing her more. Yeah. All right, traveling with Olivia. Um, 
I used to see like a part of my daily wind down is like reading different things online. And one of those things is the, is the daily mail, which mm -hmm. you might be familiar with. I am. And I would see stories of Jane and Olivia traveling lots of times in New York. So I always have this kind of connection of you being in New York. I think you were doing Annie at one point, the play. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think she was around for when you were doing Maisel, but no. uh, you traveled a lot with Olivia. Do you have any like special memories of your travels with Olivia? Yeah, the, the, the first place I took her uh, traveling was when I did a Talladega Nights in, um, in Charlotte, North Carolina, and she came with me. Her favorite place in the world is the airport mm -hmm. because she loves people. She loves people more than other dogs. She's just was such a ray of light. People would come off, you know, as we're waiting for our flight, people would come off uh, uh, deplaning and walking by her. And she was just like the greeting committee. She was, and people always came up to her. And I remember I was sitting in an airport once and I was reading and I had her on the leash and I looked over and the woman next to me uh, had her in her lap. Olivia just jumped up and sat in her lap. And that's, she'd do that at the dog park too. She wouldn't play with the other dogs. She would find an available lap. She loved people. When you would actually be on the plane with her, would she try to sit on somebody else's lap besides your own? She, uh, no, she didn't. She would stay with me. She was so good too. Um, you know, she'd be under the seat, which she didn't care for very much. And I would end up putting her in my lap and the flight attendants would walk by and pretend they didn't see it because <laughs> they're, they're supposed to stay under the seat. But she was such a good little sweet dog. Such a good, such good temperament and just loved people. How did she do when you say you were like in Los Angeles, there's more opportunities for her to say pee and poop on grass. When you would go to New York, um, there's a lot of cement and there's not as much grass. Yeah. How did you do like adjusting with her, her day-to-day -day elimination habits? Well, you know, she, we lived, we stayed at the, uh, uh, um, the Dominic hotel, which is in Soho and right next to it, they have a little public park mm -hmm. and it has like two, two little patches of grass. And I would take her there mm -hmm. and she was fine. She loved to go on grass. She had a harder time to like walk, just walking down the street, pooping on the sidewalk wasn't something she liked to do. She liked her some grass. Yeah. I'm always like curious about how, um, how urban dogs do it, especially like in New York City in the winter time or something like that where you may not have grass. So I'm glad to hear that she adjusted pretty well. She adjusted quite well. <laughs> Good. Well, um, what is your idea of the perfect pet? Oh, well, um, where they love me more than anything in the world. <laughs> it's probably the perfect pet. The perfect pet, you know, I, I, is, is it, just in terms of behavior that, and I don't seem to get these pets, but I would love to have a pet who, who knows where to go to the bathroom. Uh, our household, we fail on that. And I don't know why, uh, but uh, Mildred is now starting to get it that she goes outside. Um, but yeah, I've ruined many, many couches, um, mostly from Olivia who loved to, just go to the bathroom right between the cushions in the back. That was her favorite thing to do. Um, I, you know, I, every pet is perfect. Every pet that uh, I've met, every pet that I've had is perfect because they're just themselves. Right. You know, they're not putting on any airs and they're just 100% genuine. And, and there's a, you know, you, you can trust them to be who they are. Um, and that's not always perfect, but in the fact that just by the fact that it's genuine makes them perfect. Right. I think like the perfect eliminating dog is, is a really good role model. And certainly that's the dog I would want to have as well. We certainly want to have them go out there than inside. <laughs> and inside yes. Although we've done really well in finding products to combat things. And there's something called SCO 10X and that's S-C-O-E. Have you heard of it? No. <laughs> you can get it online, S-C-O-E 10X. And it, it eliminates um, uh, urine smell, which is great. Do doesn't do anything for stains, but it certainly can get you soak a little bit of um, it into your rug and it won't hurt it or anything. And it will neutralize the uh, smell. Wow, I'll have to check it out. That's a good, a good like product endorsement on your behalf. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Lucky it's expensive there. too, you know? I mean, it's, it's, well, it's, not that. it's like $99 a bottle, mm -hmm. uh, but it's concentrate. I'd love it if they were hearing this, um, that they would give me some for free. <laughs> well, we'll see if we could uh, reach out to them and make that happen. <laughs> well, um, do you ever have a, like a, a fantasy pet, a pet that you've always wanted to have that just maybe doesn't seem practical or wouldn't kind of fit into your household or lifestyle? No, you know, I'm a dog person and, and a cat person. I had two cats, Greta and Riley, um, in the, uh, for 20 years um, when I was in my 30s. So uh, uh, they passed away just about eight years ago or so. How old am I? I'm 60. But anyway, they, um, uh, I loved them, but I'm a dog person. I, I don't like um, want to have a horse or anything. My partner, Jennifer, loves horses. So I'm sure she would love to have one in the backyard. 
but uh, you know, I'm, and I don't, I don't need to have a jaguar or take a, take an animal out of its um, wild habitat. I, I'm a, a domestic dog person. Yeah, I agree. I, I feel like those pets are easy. They're manageable. I'm definitely much more of a dog guy than a cat guy, but I had cats as well and look forward to having them again when I can have a nice catio where they can spend time outside and kind of experience that, that outdoor yeah. living, but do it safely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I, my cats, we had a little catio for them too. I, they were my first loves for sure, Greta and Riley, when I was living in little apartments and they were the best. Were they with you in Los Angeles or Chicago or elsewhere? Yeah, they were in, in uh, let's see, I got them when I was uh, living in Beechwood Canyon in like 1992, 93. And um, so uh, they're, you know, Greta's last year was in the, the new house that you know, which is no longer a new house. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, she, she lived with me in uh, that house a year. Yeah, lucky them. Yeah. Um, well, you mentioned a purposeful rescue. I certainly know them as well. I think they do an excellent job. I know you also are a big rescue advocate all across the board. Are there any other rescues you want to kind of mention or mention kind of the work that you did with them? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I work every year with the rescue train, which is Lisa Young. She, uh, it's the uh, organization that uh, takes a, gathers a bunch of rescues and we all gather at the Rose Bowl once a year and you're usually the physician, you're usually there. And uh, it's a big kind of adoption uh, event. And we also walk around the Rose Bowl. There's an actual um, running race and walking race, um, but it's a wonderful thing to do. You know, you don't have to race. There are some people who come to race. We, we come to stroll with our animals and to talk and to socialize. And uh, then we have the event uh, and every dog or cat that, uh, and once we had a goat and I think we even had a horse, um, that is brought to the event, it goes home uh, with a family, with a forever family. And I love that. So that's um, Lisa Young's The Rescue Train. And uh, her, uh, hers, what is it called? Oh, that's called Grace for the Rescue. And, but she, her organization is The Rescue Train and she does terrific work. So if you're looking for, um, you know, somewhere to throw a donation, The Rescue Train is certainly worthy. So is a Purposeful Rescue. Uh, Hillary does the, mall, does the whole thing all by herself in her house. I thought it was incredible with um, the story of Arbuckle coming yeah. from a Purposeful Rescue and like how he was found and severely neglected and extremely overweight and had all sorts of um, underlying hormonal issues that needed to be corrected and just how all the work that you and Jennifer did to try to get him to a healthier place. I mean, he really was a success story for a long time. Certainly missed that guy, but um, he's yeah. very lucky to have been able to found so find somebody like you to take care of him the way that you did, both of you. Well, all credit goes to you, Patrick, <laughs> and Jennifer, my partner. Um, the two of you, you know, partnered in fixing that dog up and giving him a year of terrific life. Yeah, he was in bad, he was in bad shape, and um, you put him on the right medication. It was a thyroid issue. And um, he kept with the weigh-ins were a big deal. Remember we put those on Instagram and he, what he lost like 60 or 70 pounds or even more than that, right? I think it was over 100 to start and then we got him down to about 60-ish. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So he uh, reached his goal weight and died is basically <laughs> what happened. But you know, at least he got to his goal weight. Uh, he was a really, another one of those wonderful spirits. And I think if you were talking to Jennifer now, she would say that Arbuckle was that special dog right. for her, that's that soul connection. And for so many people, I mean, the following that he had on social media, everybody yeah. kind of waiting for the latest reports on his weigh-ins, um, he had so many like great things. I think in these challenging times, I mean, that was like, like 2017, 18, 19, around 18, then. Yeah, 2018. Like, certainly we were in a challenging time politically at that time. Yeah, yeah. Like, just the fact that he could bring some light to some people is really a good thing, so. It was, yeah, people just fell in love with him. He was uh, one, of those, one of those souls that just attracted so much love and he was a little angel. Yeah, miss him. Well, this is some of the fun parts of our dialogue. So um, I, of course, am a fan of anything Christopher Guest and your role as Christy Cummings in Best in Show is certainly one of the best roles of all time. And your relationship with Rhapsody and White was certainly exceptional as well. How did you kind of prepare yourself to be that character, like the, the dog trainer, the person who's showing the dog at the big dog show? Well, you start with the person first, you know, what's the psychology of the person? And Chris always, and Chris Guest gives us a, a great kind of thumbnail uh, outline of the person. And uh, so um, I just took it, you know, kind of incorporated into my heart and soul and came up with this person who had been basically neglected in high school and no one saw her, um, her light or how smart she was or how good she was. 
you know, at anything. So she was setting out to prove basically that's what motivated her. So that's all stuff that was for me. And you guys wouldn't know any of that, but that's how she became so ambitious. She was just trying to prove herself to those people who ignored her. Um, and when you deal with a, um, a show dog, you know, it's a different relationship. These dogs are working. Mm -hmm. They're not, um, you know, you're, you, they're not going to play with you. The owners aren't going to let you play with them. So I didn't really have a relationship with the dog. Um, I had to get through the, the owner slash trainer uh, to get to that dog. And she was very, and all of them were very particular about the relationship and the limits on the relationship you can have with them. But in, in order to learn how to uh, uh, show a dog, we um, had lessons with a woman who teaches that sort of thing uh, here in uh, Los Angeles. And we went to a park in Beverly Hills and she held a really, you know, a big class with regular folks, including us. And uh, we were taught how to show the dog. And uh, so that's where that started. So it was me, Catherine O'Hara, um, uh, 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 John Michael Higgins, uh, uh, and Michael Hitchcock, and Chris. I think Chris, Chris did join us for that. He probably learned you know, off on his own, as he does do things alone. He likes to do things alone. Uh, but we did it as a group. And uh, so that's where we learned the techniques. And did you actually, like, was Rhapsody in White with you at that time? No. Okay. No, 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 not at all. We used a dog that they would supply for us. Um, and I didn't meet Rhapsody White until uh, the first day we shot. And it wasn't like we were, you know, she, we were chatting each other up in between shots. You know, the, the owner slash trainer would come in and take the dog away. So I really didn't have much of a relationship with that dog. But I will say while shooting this movie, not once did we have to stop because a dog barked. Oh, wow. I mean, a really trained uh, dogs who yeah. were working they were they weren't there to be loved or play around they're special those show dogs they are special um and then is bitch magazine still in production i think it folded <laughs> after the first uh issue i'm quite sure <laughs> i don't know how, how great at business uh chrissy cummings and uh um uh, sherry sherry what was sherry's last name i forget uh, Jennifer Coolidge. I don't know how great they were at business, so I'm sure it didn't do very well. Oh, oh well, maybe it can be re revised someday. An online yeah. version, a little design. Yeah. Um, so I, of course, love the marvelous Mrs. Maisel as well. Um, there are the scenes that we see your character, Sophie Lennon, flanked by some very gallant dogs, the Borzoi. How is it spending time on set with those dogs? Same deal. They're working. Okay. You know, and um, uh, the trainers are... Uh, are right there and there's you know no like oh how are you and giving them a little rub or anything that doesn't happen <laughs> so i didn't really get to know them so did they just kind of sit next to you and you were like in kind of a very regal uh, yeah yeah i thought it was just brilliant just a brilliant thing um that i you know to meet a, a someone who's coming over to visit me i'm basically in a throne with two dogs that don't look dissimilar from me you know <laughs> they're tall and blonde and regal just like uh Sophie Lennon is. And uh, then we des they decided after we shot the scene of me in the bathtub this last season where I'm in the bathtub and I'm on the phone and I have my manservants all around me, they, they superimposed the dogs in there. They thought, what if we should add the dogs for this shot. So the, the dogs bathed with me as well. Well, <laughs> that's interesting that they actually weren't with you on the shot they superimposed into the- Yeah, they put them in there. That's the technology we have these days. <laughs> All right. Um, so besides Rhapsody and White and the Boars, are there any other exceptional animals that you worked with in your career? Well, not working with, because you know you don't get to have that kind of a relationship with that. Uh, there, it's a very controlled thing. Um, no, no, not not like it, as in Hollywood for sure. You know, while I'm working, I, I didn't get to have any exceptional relationships. They're very um, controlled. Okay. Yeah. They bring them on. They do their job. They take them off. Exactly. And they don't want you to, they don't want to, uh, the folk, the dog's focus to get split. So, I mean, you're not even allowed to give them a cookie or anything like that. It's very controlled. You're not allowed to pet them. And even, you know, eye contact, like don't, don't look at the dog because the, the dog is getting, you know, it's splitting the dog's focus. Like, oh, all right. <laughs> Sounds like a good plan. Mm -hmm. um, well, what is up next for you? And obviously we know you have, you've got a big show going on right now with um, The Weakest Link. Right. What's going on with that and, and Mrs. Maisel and everything else? Well, the weakest link, we shot all of those in September. So we shot, uh, there's 13 of them. And I think we're probably up to episode 10 wow. uh, at this point. So maybe four more episodes left. And uh, hopefully we'll shoot more. So that's, a, a, you know, that's always one of those things they tell you at the last minute. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, then Marvelous Mrs. Maisel, we are going back to work in, you know, 
God willing, and the Kirk don't rise again in January. Uh, and they're already written. They were ready to go in May. So um, it should be, uh, you know, we should probably hit the ground running. And is that something you'll shoot in New York again? Yes. Yeah, we'll shoot that in New York. Mm -hmm. Well, let's cross our fingers and hope that everything kind of settles down. We get that vaccine. Yeah. You guys can, it seems like a lot of productions, though. I mean, obviously you're doing it right now with working on uh, The Weakest Link that they have COVID protocols and you're abiding by them and staying safe and everybody's staying healthy. So yeah. Yeah, it's so far so good. You know, we haven't heard any terrible stories yet about people getting infected. And I've worked a few times and, um, you know, it's been very controlled, kind of like the relationships with dogs when they're working in Hollywood. Uh, everything's very controlled. There's a, a COVID specialist on the set who is calling the shots. And um, so far, so good. Good. Very good. Well, I think we have a couple of questions from PetCon attendees. Um, Hi. Let's see. When somebody just asked, what was your favorite pet you worked with on set? We might have already answered that, but <laughs> let's see. Why do you like animals? And if you do, do you have a pet? I think we've already discussed you have a pet. So um, maybe just one more, why do you like animals? Actually, no, wait, I'm sorry. I've, we've already answered, I have a different one. What has been the best and worst part of quarantine with your dogs? Oh, um, well, there's no bad, there's nothing bad about being, spending a lot of time with your dogs, at least for me. Um, you know, quarantine has not really cramped my style, mm -hmm. except the wearing the mask. Um, I'm not that social of a person. Uh, I still can get my coffee at my coffee shop. I can still take my walks. Um, and uh, my dogs still go to the dog park. So everything's kind of the same. Good, that's really. And then, would you ever consider adopting a cat and bringing it into the mix? I, you know, I don't know if we can have a cat now. I know that uh, Mildred has been tested with cats and she's okay. Um, and I'm sure Bernice would be okay too. And I, Jennifer loves cats. So, well, you know, that's something we could think about. But right now, we're trying to uncomplicate our lives as much as possible. And that might add a complication. Yeah. And then one final one, who are your dogs named after? Um, let's see if they're, you know, Bernice and Mildred uh, just came to us uh, out, out of the, the, the vapors. But um, Olivia was named after two people, Olivia de Havilland and Olivia Newton-John. And I told Olivia Newton-John that she was so touched because she's a big dog lover. Uh, we named, let's see, who else did we have? Ben was gentle Ben. Um, Riley, I didn't name after anybody. Uh, Arbuckle was named after Fatty Arbuckle, the actor, who was a, a fat actor, and Arbuckle was a fat dog, at least in the beginning. And uh, I think that's it. Millie came to us as Millie, I believe. We had another Millie. We had a Mildred and a Millie. Um, and this Millie came to us as a Millie as well, but we wanted to distinguish her from the other Millie, so we call her Mildred. All sweet names, good stories. Certainly uh, loved, loved having dogs that have unusual names. Yes, well, we, fa we favor the lesbian aunt names, <laughs> like Aunt Bernice, Aunt Mildred, Aunt <laughs> Millie. <laughs> well, it, it works. It, uh, I certainly appreciate that, that sentiment. Um, well, that is the end of our interview, Jane. I really appreciate you being here and certainly dedicating your time to animal welfare. And certainly your presence here helps to raise attention to the cause of PetCon, which is all, all proceeds are going to the Animal Cancer Foundation, which is an important uh, foundation to me, especially having had a dog with cancer twice and then seeing like so many pa patients that develop cancer of the year. So we really appreciate you dedicating your time to animals and to this cause. You bet. Thank, Thank you, Jane. So much. I look forward to seeing you back in town or up in Montecito at some point. <laughs> Sounds great. See ya. Bye.